Today our scripture comes from the book of Psalm, chapter 105. I should turn this on. Chapter 105, verses 1 through 5. It says this, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name. Make him known his deeds among the people. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And check this out. Seek the Lord and seek his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered. So these past two weeks, Victor has been talking about the first two simple rules. Do no harm and do good. And naturally that leaves me with the last one. Stay in love with God. So when looking for scripture to cover today's message, I ran across Psalm 105 in one of my daily devotions. And God gave me a bit of an aha moment. So I broke the first five verses down into three different parts. This first part, verse 3 through 4, has us a goal of staying in love with God. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. If we want to stay in love with God, then we first need to seek him out. And then we need to be consistently connecting with Christ. Verse 1 through 2 gives us a trusted way of showing our love to God through giving thanks to God and singing with some enthusiasm and telling everybody about what God has personally done for us. Verse 5 serves as a guide and kind of maintenance for how we can stay in love with God. The author tells us to remember what God has done for us, all of his miracles for us, and the way he guides us. We need to remember the personal things so that we can have a personal relationship with God. But if you want to stay in love with God, then you need to fall in love with God first. And I think we look past this maybe too much, because whenever we hear somebody call themselves a Christian, we just assume that they love God. And while this is often true, in reality, not all Christians know God that well. So how can they love God that well? So how do we fall in love with God? Let's go back to the basics. If you're anything like me, then you probably like having short and simple instructions on how to do things. So I was looking for the 10 simple steps to falling in love with God. No dice. I couldn't find any lists. But check this out. Jesus said, in order to love him, we must first obey him. And since Jesus and God are the same dude, if we want to love God, then we need to obey God. Now, I know that obeying God sounds super Old Testament, and it sounds kind of like a burden, but that's just because of the glasses that we put on. We have to realize that we aren't being forced to obey God. In reality, obeying God is an option in the same way that following Christ is an option. But don't sit there and think that you get all the goodness of following God if you don't obey him. You don't have to obey God, but if you do, now watch this, you get to live a life that feels full, and you get to live a life that gives you a purpose, and you get to live a life that's filled with love. You don't have to follow and obey, you get to. Think about it like this. If, so I've chosen to date my girlfriend, and she's chosen to date me somehow, and if I want to love her, then I need to follow and obey her rules that she has given to me. Has anybody ever had to deal with that, had to follow the rules of the person you're with? <laughs> if I didn't want to love her, then what I would do is not obey the rules. I'd do whatever I want to and not have to worry about the consequences. But because I want this relationship to last a good amount of time, then I'm going to need to follow the rules that she has set in place for me and vice versa. But you know... Just because you believe in God, that doesn't mean that you're walking with Christ. I mean, how are we supposed to obey God if we don't even take the time to really understand what he's expecting from us and learn what he wants us to do? You know, like, how can you fall in love with God by just following the rules? So my girlfriend, she, uh, she just got into this thing called the Five Love Languages. It's a book and a test written by Dr. Gary Chapman. Has anybody seen this or taken the test or read the book? Cool. So the purpose of this test and book is to teach each other what your partner's 
love language is, which is how they love the best, how they receive love the best. This can help strengthen your love for each other and hopefully strengthen your relationship for the future. Now there's five possible test results and because I wanted to keep and obey my girlfriend, I decided I should probably do this the minute she sent it to me. <laughs> so it turns out that my love language is physical touch. Now what this does not mean is at the end of this message, you cannot come up and start poking me. It's not going to make me love you. <laughs> what this does mean is that I like to be active in the relationship and I like to go out and do things and bump into you occasionally enough to where I know that you're real and you're not just a mannequin or a cardboard cutout. For her, her love language was quality time. Now, for me, this was tricky. You know, we really just started looking at this love language thing while I was gearing up for licensing school, so about a month and a half ago. And although I was prepping for that, we still hung out just about every single day, all day, for months. And yes, I would bring my homework with me whenever we hung out, and I'd be thinking about homework when we watched movies. And Guys, there was a lot of homework to do for this licensing school stuff. <laughs> but more than once, my girlfriend would get this look on her face and her posture would change, and I'd think, oh gosh, what did I do now, you know? When I would ask what's wrong, she would say stuff like, I miss you, and I feel like I just don't get to see you enough. Girl, I've sat next to you for five hours straight every single day. What do you mean you don't see me enough? But here's the thing. I was giving her a large quantity of time, but I wasn't necessarily giving her quality time. I was distracted. Now, I'm willing to bet that God's love language is quality time, too. In fact, in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, it says, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. Essentially, God is saying, look, guys, the gifts are nice. I like the gifts, but I'm really just wanting to hang out and get to know you. That's all I really want. And that's the key to falling in love with God. Y'all need some quality time together. I'm talking about putting the phone down when you're at the dinner table kind of quality time. I mean, how can you fall in love with somebody if you never engage in conversations with them and you never get to know who they are? It's easy to be physically present at church and to say a prayer as we're nodding off to bed. I'm very guilty of the last one. But if we aren't engaged with God, then our physical presence won't mean that much. God's not looking for present people. He's looking for engaged people. Like when the hymns play, it's not about singing just loud enough to where your neighbor hears you or too loud to where your neighbor looks at you funny. Singing is supposed to be singing to God. Worship is one of the best ways that we can respond to God in his own love language. Again, I'm a physical touch guy, and I like to put things in, put all of life into metaphors and mental images, and I know it's weird and whatever. But So I try to love God through my own love language. So this is going to get dramatic, and it's going to get really cringy, so just kind of buckle up, okay? You ready? So this is how I see worship. I'm in a room, and there's a bunch of people, but the only thing I can focus on is me and my date. Really romantic, right? Just me and my date. God and I are standing here, his hands on my shoulders and my hands on his hips, and we're swaying back and forth. And I start to sing a love song to him. Amazing grace. Can you guys picture all this? It's kind of cringy, right? <laughs> worship is supposed to be an intimate way for us to fall in love with God. Worship is like dancing with God. Praying is like God and I are hanging out on the couch with a bowl of popcorn and a movie playing, but neither of us are paying attention to the movie because we're so deep in conversations about who I want to be when I grow up, letting me vent about my day and about how awful the world is. God probably sitting there patiently waiting for me to shut up so he can talk to me because I talk too much when I pray. Praying is supposed to feel intimate like your favorite conversations where the hours just fly by and nobody notices or cares because they're just enjoying the moment. Outreach is like God and I are at a soup kitchen and everybody who comes through the line immediately recognizes God and smiles real big and says, hey, thanks for all your love and all the grace that you've been giving me. And I'm standing in the corner with a dripping soup ladle and my jaw dropped because 
I thought I was here to, to tell them about God. I thought that's why I was here. But in reality, they might know God on a more intimate level than I do. But God's looking at me and saying, hey, scoop the soup. I can't do this without you. Outreach is supposed to be intimate because it allows you to give love to others, but receive love from God in the most unexpected places. Some people fell in love with God because of how another person treated them or because they walked out the front door and saw just how beautiful nature was and they just couldn't believe that somebody had created this. Now, I really hope that those really cringy illustrations stick with you, but if they don't, Try to imagine God through your own love language and how God loves you and how you can love God. The takeaway here is that loving God is supposed to be intimate. Okay, so Pastor Ian, it's a new title. I'm going to wear it pretty well. Pastor Ian, this whole time you've talked about falling in love with God, but the message is supposed to be about staying in love with God. What gives? Okay, so here's something really cool. One of the best ways to stay in love with God is to remember why you fell in love with God in the first place. Check out verse 5 from Psalm. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he has uttered. Were you waltzing through the sanctuary to the tune of Amazing Grace? Then when that piano plays by Lane, you need to start singing loud and, and getting into it, smiling and raising your hands because you love God and you want to show Him. If you don't know where to start, then follow the first two rules that Victor has been talking about over the weeks. Do no harm and do good. It's like taking God out on a date. You know, you're dipping your feet in the water, trying things out. But when you're ready to commit, it's time to get intimate. To keep staying in love with God is the same as any other relationship. You have to choose to love God. And you have to choose to keep that commitment alive by following his rules and spending time with him. So go ahead and answer these three questions in your heart. Do you love God? Why do you love God? And how will you keep that love alive? So remember to do no harm, to do good, and to always stay in love with God. Would you please bow your head and pray with me? Gracious God, we know that you love us unconditionally and you know us intimately. And Lord, we want to do the same with you. As we continue to open ourselves up to you, Lord, draw us in so that we may know you well. It's in your holy name that our people pray. Amen. For our app, our website, findhopedowntown.org, through which you can give, uh, stay connected, or watch sermon videos that you might have.